Thank you. And I want to thank Elon University again for hosting this event. Great turnout, great weather, especially having you in here when you be outside. <laughs> As I said earlier, I've lived in Alamance County 50 years, and I've lived, I mean, had a business here for 30 years. But I've also been connected to the, the university for a long time. I had a sister that graduated in 1975. I took freshman English here in 1976. And my mom, who's with me today, was the assistant bookstore manager when it was Elon College in the early 70s. So, Jan, I love you, and thanks so much for coming today. A lot of times you see 98% say, but that's pretty good. That's something I'm proud of, you know, the top 98% of your class, your score, whatever. But if you didn't look at the program, that's not a very good number. The percentage of clothes that we buy today now made overseas. We have an unbroken apparel system. How did that happen? I've had the opportunity to be in the apparel business for 30 years. I remember what the apparel business used to be, and I lived through that. I remember when it used to be 98% here. Now it's 98% away. So we're going to talk about today, how did that happen? How do we get it back, and how do we prevent it? I go to a lot of high school schools and classes. Usually at Elon, when I talk about this, they know that. And looking at this audience here, you understand that. But when you go to high school students and talk about NAFTA, no clue. What does it stand for? You understand, North American Free Trade Agreement. Prior to that, I had a business. I talked to TS Designs. We do printed T-shirts. We did work for companies like Nike, Tommy, Gap, Polo. Well over 100 people worked at TS Designs. Very successful business, very profitable business. We basically gave bonuses. Our employees had health care. Our employees had retirement. 1994, this becomes law. The brands could not get overseas quick enough. So I saw my very successful business in a period of two years go from 100 employees to 14. I looked very closely at the bankruptcy and a long time without getting a paycheck. So when we look at this and where this is taking us, we end up here. This is Bangladesh, April 2013. The worst apparel disaster in history. Over 1,000 people died. 2,000 people were injured. And people say, oh my God, how does that happen? Why do we let that happen? Real simple economics. We pay those people 26 cents per hour. So don't be surprised when you have a publicly traded company that's in business to maximize return for their shareholders. Where are you going to go? You're going to go and get the cheapest labor. 26 cents an hour is what those people were paid. And I was reading later that we gave death benefits to those people if they could validate they died. They got a whopping $700 if they could prove they had a relative down there. So that's where our apparel industry is gone. We run around the world chasing cheap labor, so we benefit from it. We haven't a broken apparel system. Six years ago, I met this gentleman here, Ronnie Burleson. Ronnie's a cotton farmer in New London, North Carolina. They do about 3,000 acres of cotton every year. So I went to Ronnie about six years ago. So Ronnie, I said, I want to buy some of your cotton. He says, why does a t-shirt guy want to buy my cotton? You can buy from Haynes or Gildan or Fruitland or whatever. Why do you want to buy my cotton? He says, Ronnie, I want to buy your cotton because we're going to do something different here in North Carolina. We're going to create cotton of the Carolinas. We're going to create a system which I define as a supply chain where I go, we go dirt to shirt. We do it in 600 miles. We impact 500 jobs. And the most important thing, we do it in a completely transparent supply chain. We connect the consumer to the farmer. Because today, North Carolina is somewhere in the top five, usually top three, of cotton growing states in the US. We take about 80% of that cotton, spin it up as yarn, ship it around the world. So you can go to your local big box store here in Alamance County and buy a t-shirt 
It traveled over 13,000 miles before it came back here. We do it in 600 miles. But I think what the most important thing that we're doing, and it's like we're doing their food, is we're doing it in a transparent supply chain. As I said, we connect the consumer to the farmer. And the way we do that, and the shirt that I'm wearing today, if you looked at the tag, there'll be a style number. You take that style number, you drop it into a Google map. And from that Google map, you can go all the way to Ronnie Burleson. You'll get Ronnie's picture, you'll get Ronnie's phone number, you'll get Ronnie's email, you'll get Ronnie's physical address. You can go visit Ronnie. You can go visit Wes the Jenner. You can go visit Mark the Spinner. You can see everybody that's involved in our supply chain. And what they used to tell you in business school, oh my God, you just told somebody to be in the t-shirt business. And I says, well, if you got enough money and you're foolish enough, then knock yourself out. But we think there's more value to making yourself transparent and basically let your consumer know who you are than anything else. And the big terminology we're talking about today, you hear a lot, is reshoring. Bringing jobs back to America. They're not all going to come back. I'm not expecting them all to come back. We just have to balance the scales. I think 98%, 2%, we can do better than that. I'll leave you with a couple words and one homework project. So we are a university, so you do have projects here. The first one says, I think what's most important in today's society, not only in manufacturing, but in our political system, is transparency. We need to know where things are coming from, where our money's going, where things are being made. But I'm very concerned of the lack of transparency that we're having in our manufacturing and our political system. If we had better transparency, we might not have that situation in Bangladesh where over 1,000 people died. And I sure can tell you, I think with better transparency, we'll have a better political system in this country. The other thing that I'm a big, big, big fan of is local. Because what happens with local, you're keeping the money within your community. You're supporting the people you know. And again, just like all the manufacturers not coming back here, we're not able to make everything here. But it makes no sense, in the summertime is a good example, to go to your local big box grocery store and buy tomatoes that are being shipped from California. We can buy them right here in Alamance County. Keep those dollars local. Support your community and support your neighbor. Last thing in your homework project. Go home, look at your shirt, look at your pants, look at your blouse, know where it's made. Take that responsibility. I'm not saying it's good or it's bad to be made in China or Bangladesh, but it starts with you. It starts with knowing. And if we're going to start turning this around, and if we're going to start fixing our food system, if we're going to start fixing manufacturing, we're going to bring jobs back here, it starts with you. The problem we have with we get so infatuated with the price, we never ask the other question. So just start going down that journey. I like to say sustainability is a journey, not a destination. So start that journey today by taking the step and taking that responsibility. Look at that label. Find out where it's made. Do your research so we do not have another disaster like we had in Bangladesh and we can bring jobs back here in North Carolina. And thank you so much.